Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together on Sundays in the second epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last video, we were in the context of chapter 11. And we were looking at the reality concerning uh, those who are false apostles, uh, who masquerade as messengers of light, uh, this is our Wednesday night. Uh, I get to talk about whatever I want to talk about. Uh, we are looking forward to a possible rapture uh, this September. Um, so we are looking up. We know that our redemption draweth nigh. We know that the Lord is coming back for us soon. And in, in the second, uh, the second Thessalonians, uh, I'm going to use this for my uh, for the basis of this video here. The second chapter of Second Thessalonians. That's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, two Thessalonians, chapter two, and uh, I'll explain the reasons why for that as we go along. So there's 17 verses in the second chapter of Second Thessalonians. If you'd like to turn there. Uh, that would be great. Uh, we're going to quickly go through these 17 verses, and I'm going to try to outline for you uh, what I see in the text and, and how it relates to what's going on in our lives today and uh, what's uh, bound to happen uh, here in the near future. So looking at, at, uh, at this, we need a, a little background on this. Uh, the the church at Thessalonica, uh, they were of the mind that the, they were in the uh, period of the Great Tribulation that uh, preceded the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed because of all the persecution that was occurring there in the first century that they were in that period, that, that the day of the Lord, they were in the day of the Lord. Uh, that phrase, day of the Lord, is a very unique phrase. Uh, unique uh, to Christianity, unique to uh, the uh, the biblical text. It is a phrase that particularly refers to that that period of time, the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's seventieth week, uh, that that seven year roughly uh, period of of tribulation that uh, many people think that we will today even go through. And that alone is something I, I, we should take note of right here from the very start. It's in the context of the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ for the church, which is interesting. Uh, so as we look at verse 1, uh, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye, that's verse 1, uh, verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ, that is literally the day of the Lord, is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come several things first. And most of you... Uh, Watchmen, especially, and, and many of you, many Christians are aware of the of the fact that there is several things that have to occur. One is the, a, a great falling away uh, from the faith, or a removal of the church, depending on how you interpret that passage. Uh, what I should be doing here is I should be actually have the Greek text open so that I can go through this and point out a few things that I think that you're going to find interesting. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, I'll be also reading from the King James Version. But uh, I'm going to pull up the, the, the Greek interlinear here and we'll go through some of these some of these verses. And I'll point out a few things I believe are really important that we see that uh, here. This 
it's been a while since I've done a video on eternal security, the security of the believer. Uh, you, you, it is Second Thessalonians chapter two is one of the, especially the end of the chapter, is one of the strongest arguments for the eternal security of the believer, and not just that, but a, a very strong argument for the gospel itself, and. Uh, in a very strong argument, uh, proof text, you might say, for the fact that uh, that there will be a rapture and that it's pre-trib. The rapture occurs before the, the period known as Daniel's 70th week. Paul says, we implore you now, you brothers, by the coming, and that, that same word is going to, we'll see it used again twice, once in reference to out his coming for the church once in reference to his coming at the, the at the second advent of the lord of us jesus christ and our gathering together unto him our gathering together unto him so it starts out with the very thing that we're looking forward to at this particular time which is the removal of the church Paul explains that they're not to be shaken, they're not to be troubled in mind, not to be, not to be despairing, uh, not to be afraid. Uh, you see in the Greek text, uh, the, the, the words there are used uh, to be shaken uh, or to be troubled. Both of those Greek words infer something very troublesome and very discomforting. Uh, they had literally thought that they were in that time period. Uh, Paul assures them that they were not because several things had to happen first. So they were neither to be troubled uh, or shaken by, uh, by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter. Uh, in any shape, form, or fashion, they were not to be troubled. Uh, as if that day was now present, the day of the Lord. Uh, here we see the day of the Lord uh, that is... Uh, uh, Amara to Kuriu, that is, the, you know, in the, in the Greek, the, the day, it's articulated, the day of the Lord. It's a phrase often used in Scripture, which is in, in, in association with that period. And they were not to be troubled by that. So there was some, some comfort uh, that Paul, Paul was, the text makes it clear that Paul was interested uh, and you could say the Holy Spirit here. Paul just merely held the pen. The Holy Spirit is very interested in the comfort of God's people that they not put, that they first of all put first things first and that they not uh, make assumptions that are not true based upon what they see outwardly. I'm sure if we had all been back there and we were looking around and seeing everything that was going on, we may have very well have done that ourselves. We may have thought that the day of the Lord was at hand. I mean, Christianity was young. It was new. Uh, they had no idea how long the church was going to uh, remain until His coming. Uh, but there was a possibility that they would be deceived in verse 3. Uh, but Paul makes it clear there has to be a, the apostasy first. And then uh, where the, the man of lawlessness, that's obviously the Antichrist, uh, had to be revealed. That word there, you know, apostasia, uh, you know, falling away, you can translate that. You have every right to translate that of falling away from the faith. I'm, I'm not sure that that's exactly what that means. The word literally just means to leave or depart is what the word means. It's a departure. It's a, a leaving from a previous standing. That is literally what the, the, the Greek word apostia means. Leaving from a previous standing. Uh, so you could look at that as, as a direct reference to the rapture. In fact, the, the context seems to support it uh, in verse 1. So until there was a falling away first and the man of lawlessness was revealed. the son of destruction. 
text goes on in verse 4, the one opposing, and this is where it gets interesting to me. Uh, some of you out there may not find this very interesting at all. The one opposing and exalting himself. And let's just stop right there. Uh, there are numerous mentions, passages in the New Testament that speak of, in, in, in quite negative terms, of this whole reality of self in the Christian life. We've been crucified with, uh, to, uh, uh, with Christ. Uh, we've died to self. We died to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and, and even death itself. But one of the major, major things that we've died to is ourselves. And that shouldn't surprise any Christian at all. Because we don't exalt ourselves. I don't know very many Christians, and I don't think you do either, who walk around believing that, that, that we are to exalt ourselves you know, uh, before God, that we are to oppose God and exalt ourself, uh, ourselves, given the fact that we died to self in order that we might live unto God. And many Christians get the wrong idea that we have uh, got to die to ourself, that God's left it up to us, that we need to die to self. Uh, we do need to die to self. Uh, in, in an experiential sense, where the, what is true of us in, in, in reality becomes true of us in our experience. But uh, it's not that we have to crucify self. We have died. It's not that we need to die. We have died and we need to know that we've died. We've died to self. We've died to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and even death. But here we've got the Holy Spirit, through Paul, telling the church there at Thessalonica that they were, uh, uh, they could very well expect that that when this occurred, when the church was either taken or there was a great falling away from the faith, and the and the, the man of of lawlessness was revealed, uh, the son of perdition, the Antichrist was revealed, that there would be. Uh, uh, that would that would usher in that period of Daniel's seventieth week, and he goes into describing the character and the nature of Satan. And what I want you to see in this, folks, is is that when we look at the character and the nature of Satan as described here, I think we need to take note, very serious note of of this because it is possible in the life of the Christian for him to mimic those same characteristics. Of course, no Christian would love, would want to admit or like to admit that his life, his, his character uh, reflects the very nature of Satan himself. But in our study back in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, we, we have been looking at how that Satan masquerades his messengers as angels of light, as messengers of the gospel. It's a different spirit. It's a different gospel. Uh, it's the same Jesus in many cases, but it's the, the same spirit, uh, or it's the, it's, the, it's, the same, it's the same Jesus, but it's a different spirit and a different gospel. And that, that is highly important to take note of here because God has revealed to us that Satan is alive and well. He's not trying to work to get you into hell, but he's trying to get you to believe in another spirit, another gospel, to follow another gospel, another teaching, uh, uh, other, other doctrine that is not consistent with the Word of God, which in which... Uh, which basically exalts, opposes everything good and holy, opposes God, opposes, resists the truth of the Word of God, and it exalts self. That's the point I'm, I was trying to get to here. If we don't believe in the true gospel, if we believe that we are under a system 
a religious system based on human merit, which leads to pride, which was Satan's downfall and the downfall of many a Christian. If that's what we believe, then what we are doing is we are doing exactly the same thing that the Holy Spirit through Paul is telling the Thessalonians, which would happen during the tribulation period uh, when, the, when, when the Antichrist arri arrives on the scene. But more importantly, this is the, the nature and the character of Satan, whether you, we're, we're, in, we're talking about the tribulation period or the church age period, the dispensation of grace or or whatever period that we're, we're looking at. If we can look at the Old Testament period and, and we could, in looking at the Old Testament uh, period, we can uh, say with just as much certainty that, that Satan exalts himself, that he opposes everything that is, that's good and holy. Uh, the text says the one opposing and exalting himself above every so-called God or object of worship so as for him in the temple of God to sit down. And let's just stop right there. We are today the temple of God. There is no temple on earth. Uh, the first temple was destroyed. The second temple is destroyed. Many Christians are looking for the third temple to be built. We are church age saints. We are all members, that Paul says, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, says we're members of that one body, the temple of God, that is Christ. Christ is the temple. We are not all a bunch of little temples running around, but we are members of the one temple, which is the body of Christ. And what we're reading here in 2 Thessalonians in the first, in the first few verses, in, in verse 4 of chapter 2, is, is that, What occurs during that tribulation period is that Satan sits down in the temple of God and he sets himself up, he's setting, setting forth, he himself, that he is God. He presents himself as God. Now, I, I know that many of you are going to think this, well, Steve, you know, you're really stretching it here. This is a giant leap from, from, from the devil sitting in the temple during the tribulation period and claiming to be God uh, and uh, a believer today who is sitting in the temple. I'm talking about a Christian who's a member of his body, the church, the temple, who is sitting, uh, you might say, in the temple, setting himself up as God. Well, how does a Christian do that? I'm going to suggest that Christians do that every day. If you're exalting yourself, if you're not exalting Christ, but you're exalting yourself, if you're living under that system based on human merit, where the, you, your life is basically oozing with pride, and you're preaching a, 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 Christian, a Christianity that is based on human performance in the production of human works, then you are exalting yourself, yourself as God. You're God, okay? I don't know how many Christians I've, I've spoke to who, they, they would never come right out and say, you know, well, I think I'm God. Pastor Steve, I think I'm God. That's not what they say. But by their, their, by their very nature, and I'm talking about Christians here, through, through, by their very theology, and through their faith system, their belief system, by believing that that it that that we are somehow, you know, our relationship with God is based on human merit, that is exactly what they're 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 saying, whether they want to believe that or say that or not. They we are we exalt ourselves, we are God. It's not God is not God, we are God because we're in control. We know what's best for us. God doesn't. We take the lead. God follows. You know, we, we, the ultimate decision rests with us. You know, that sort of thing. We, in essence, in essence, we're God. Our will trumps God's will somehow. You know, we, our will is stronger than God's. God has left us 
left it up to us to work out our salvation, uh, you know, in such a way that, well, it's uh, the outcome of it is dependent upon how we how we act, how how we live. You know, we're God. We are the captains, the captain of our fate. We're the cap. We're the captain of our destiny. You know, the captain of our souls. We we determine, you know, human will, so-called free will, determines man's destiny. So therefore, God's not really God. I mean, we call him that, but he's not really God. He's he's just something less than God, because our will trumps God's will, or God doesn't interfere with our free will. So it's it, you know, God sits back. He he wants. This is what he wants. He, he wishes that we would do something. And boy, I mean, he just really, really w does. He really wishes we'd do something. Uh, and we don't. And he's disappointed. He's disappointed in us. None of that describes genuine, authentic Christianity. Now, there's a pseudo-Christianity. Uh, that we're going to look at here. We do not oppose and exalt ourselves above the one true God. We don't sit in the temple of God as believers, as members of His body, the church, the temple of God. We don't sit there uh, setting our, uh, up ourselves as God. The one who's in ultimately in control you know this uh, this channel has always been big on the sovereignty of god and that's that's uh, an un uh, in our unarguable fact i mean uh, we are uh, living and always have been from the moment you were born god never left you to your own devices you know, and, and I, I'll even go as far as to say whether you're a believer or, or, or a non-believer, God's will will be done in heaven and on earth. Your will can never trump God's will. It's one of the great tragedies of Christianity today, among Christians today, one of the great heartbreaks among Christians today, which, which leads to heartbreak and which causes heartbreak among other Christians who see these Christians you know, thinking that, that they are, they somehow, you know, uh, they're not really led by a sovereign God who, who loves them, who, who's, who's mapped out their, their very path, charted out their, their, their path, who, who works all things together for the good, um, uh, to those who love God and are called to, according to His purpose. Everything in the text, in this passage, in these 17 verses, I mean, I've scoured through these 17 verses and I can't find any, any hint whatsoever of there being anything other than the revelation that we are living, whether we're living, we were living back then or whether we're, we're, whether we're reading this back then in the first century or whether we're reading this today in, in, in 2023, We are constantly being reminded of the fact that we are not, and we should be reminding one another of the fact that we are not, first of all, we're not in the tribulation period. This is Second Thessalonians. I'm, I'm, I'm certain that when Paul makes reference that uh, to the asking them if they remember, do you remember that yet being with you these things I was saying to you? I'm sure that uh, that that's exactly what occurred. And now that which is restraining, that would be the Holy Spirit in the church, the body of Christ. You know, you have a perfect knowledge that for. Uh, that which is restraining. Uh, that's that's us. 
The Holy Spirit in us is holding back the judgment of the non-believer. You know, non-believers don't typically like Christians very much, but you know, it'd, it'd be interesting if they at least stopped long enough to, to consider the fact that what may possibly, quite very possibly be holding back their judgment is our presence here. And uh, but because once our presence is removed, once the church is removed, raptured, then uh, all hell breaks loose and God comes in judgment. If we go on to verse 6, or verse 7 here, for the mystery already is working of lawlessness. It's, a, it's an interesting phrase. Now, you know, of course, we know that the word mystery there is, is in, in uh, of course, many, many Christians read that word and they think that, well, that mystery means something that, that we can't know. That's not the case at all. It's something, it's not something unknowable. Uh, it's, what it is, is it's, it's what it, the word means is it means that it's, it's what can only be known through revelation because God reveals it. It's, it's not, uh, in the Bible, a, a mystery, the word mysterion, is not something that's unknowable. It's just something that that's, uh, can only be known through revelation. So uh, it uh, may have been once hidden, uh, but it's not unknowable. And there's a mystery of iniquity, iniquity that's already at work, already at work. It was in Paul's time, it is today, and it will be until until we be taken out of the way. Verse 7. There's one restraining it, that's the Holy Spirit, at present until out of the midst He might be gone. Verse 8. And then will be revealed the lawless one whom the Lord Jesus will slay with the breath of the mouth of Him and will annul by the appearing of the coming of Him. That word annul is an interesting word. It, it just uh, basically, we're looking at uh, Satan being uh, uh, discharged, severed, uh, annulled, abolished. Uh, he's uh, made of no effect. It's, uh, it's rendering something inert, uh, completely inoperative. It's, he's totally without force. He's completely brought down. He's uh, done away with. He's uh, made uh, invalid. He's made inactive. He just will have no power at all. And he's, it says, by the appearing of the coming of Him. The coming of Him. Now, I know there's a lot of Christians that are not pre-trib, but I, if you really take time to study the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians, you, you can see so much. What, what I love about the chapter is you can see so much there. You can see that, that they were in the first century thinking they were in the tribulation period. You can see how that Paul is saying that can't possibly be the case, that they have to be removed first before the man of lawlessness is revealed, that, that there would be a, a great falling away or an apostasy or a catching away. That's us, the church. If you want to look at it that way, I believe it's the text that will allow you to look at it that way. Uh, and that the character of the very one who's deceiving us in, back in 2 Corinthians is the very one that's going to be deceiving them during the tribulation period. And that shouldn't surprise us. The Lord will slay him with the breath of his mouth that's His Word, the Word of God. We read in Hebrews how the Word of God is, is, a, is a sharp-edged sword, double-edged sword. And He'll annul Him by the appearing of His coming. So now we're looking, you know, we, Paul's brought them, or the Holy Spirit's brought the Thessalonians to the point of the, the second coming of Christ. And then he goes on beyond, who's whose coming is according to the working of Satan in every power and in signs and in wonders of falsehood 
This is what occurs during the tribulation period, but I want you to take note when you read this verse 9 that what you're reading there in verse 9 about Satan during the tribulation period is no different than what is occurring today with Satan in the church. There are false apostles that are according to the working of Satan. That they, they, uh, it's the word falsehood is pseudo. It's, it's false. Verse 10. And in every deceit of wickedness unto those perishing, and that word perishing means to utterly perish, in return for which the love of the truth not they received in order for to be saved them. Here we see the word sozo, saved, used in the context of non-believers utterly being condemned and perishing because they perished because they didn't receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. And of course the argument could come up and I, I can hear it already, you know, well, Steve, uh, Pastor you know, Steve, this 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 is a clear indication that that uh, the reason why they weren't saved is because they didn't do something, and that's have the love of the truth, so as to be saved. The text won't allow you to say that. Just because they didn't have the love of the truth does not imply that they could have had the love a love for the truth. The reason why they didn't have a love for the truth is because they weren't his people. And as we go on down through this text and we get to, toward the end of, of, the, of the chapter, uh, we're going to see just how that supports that. In return for which the love of the truth, not they received, in order for to be saved them. And that, and that word is sozo. It means delivered, but delivered from hell in this case. Okay, the, the text has every right to use the word saved, uh, sozo delivered in the context of their perishing or not being delivered so we go on to verse 11 and because of this god will send to them a a working uh, uh delusion a strong delusion for them to believe what is false that's pseudo the word pseudo again in the greek uh it's because they're not his that God sends them a strong delusion. Now, I think the context bears out the fact, I think this points back to uh, the previous verse which, which cited uh, Satan uh, sitting down on the temple of God claiming himself to be God. I think that the, the strong delusion, and this is just my own interpretation, my own opinion, I think the strong delusion is not some, it's not talking about, you know, the world is deluded into thinking that aliens abducted us, or the, the world is deluded into believing this, that, or the other thing, but the delusion, the strong delusion here that, that in which these people during the tribulation period who are, are not God's people are deceived and deluded is uh, it's a situation in which they be actually believe that the Antichrist was the true Messiah. I believe that is the strong delusion. And without getting into talking about other religions, particularly one that came along in about the in the 600 A 600 AD there, uh, which dominates the Middle East. Uh, Many of you know what religion I'm talking about. This, uh, this strong delusion is, is very much a, a, a big part of their, their life. In order that should be judged all those, and I'm just reading from the Greek, in order that should be judged all those not having believed the truth, but having delighted in unrighteousness. They took pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, if you ask most Christians today, you know, uh, who are, are even out of fellowship with God, you know, well, do you take pleasure in unrighteousness? If they were to be honest, totally honest, they'd have to say yes, because that's what, that's, that's what sin is. 
uh, sin can be pleasurable. Okay, uh, Do you take pleasure in unrighteousness? The text is telling us that these who are, decei are deceived during that period, they are judged they they did not they had they didn't have a, a love for the truth so as to be saved, but what they what they did was they delighted, they took pleasure in unrighteousness, and we want to make unrighteousness. Well, let's let's see what what do we want to make that? We want to make that. Uh, we took we took pleasure in bowling, uh, playing poker, uh, drinking whiskey, uh, you know, playing cards, playing Monopoly, playing. You know, you can't play Monopoly. That's, that's, that leads to greed. Okay, you know, all, all of these things, you know, whatever you want to add to your list, that's unrighteousness. The word there for uh, dalkia, righteous, righteous, is it's our, uh, the famous word dalkia. Uh, this is ah, dalkia, it's the negative of that is they took pleasure in what they believed was righteousness. It is uh, the word, uh, it, it's a, uh, it basically means it's uh, what is contrary to his righteous judgments uh, or what he approves. Uh, God does not approve. He does not approve in the believer's life him exalting himself, uh, living under the law, walking according to the flesh. These are not the things that please God, and they're not the things that lead to true righteousness. And they, but they took, they take pleasure in what they're doing. What I'm going to suggest to you folks is that when you read this, if you don't at least stop and at least take a moment to uh, give some thought to the fact that there are Christians today who are delighting in unrighteousness. And what do I mean by that? They're, they're, they're delighting, they're taking pleasure in the fact that they are presenting themselves as persons who are acceptable to God based upon their own performance. And that's what gives them pleasure. They, that's, what gives, that's what delights them. But, but it, they are taking pleasure in unrighteousness. And that's how I look at that. Verse 13. We, however, ought to give thanks to God always concerning you, brothers. Now we're shifting over into a very comforting uh, dialogue between the Holy Spirit and His people here. We ought to give thanks to God always concerning you, brothers. Now we're, we're getting away from from those ones to ourselves by the Lord that has chosen you, chosen you from the beginning unto election in the sanctification of the Spirit and the faith of the truth. Of course, uh, the doctrine of election is something that's hated with a passion today. You know, we don't choose God. Uh, God chose us. Uh, in most Christian minds today, the, the attitude is that we choose God. God doesn't choose us. If He does choose us, it's he, His choice is based upon our having chosen Him, which doesn't make a lick of sense. It's either one or the other. It can't be both. And of course, it isn't both. The, the, Scripture never presents this as a cooperative, synergistic activity between God and man. Jesus told His disciples directly, you did not choose Me, I chose you. Uh, he chose Abraham. He chose Paul. He chose you. He chose Me. This is just a fact of the matter. It's, it's, uh, we're, we need to be willing to accept the fact that God chose a family for Himself, that He's entitled to that. You know, you, you wouldn't, uh, you, you'd probably argue, most Christians would argue vehemently that, th that they have a right to choose their own, you know, a family. If, I want, if you want to get married and have, have children and raise a family, that's your right. You know, as, a, as a, human, a free human being, you know, you have a right to do that. 
course, God doesn't, is what you're saying. You know, you have that right, but God doesn't. God doesn't have a right to have a family of His own. And I don't know how many videos that I've done where we, we've, and I, how many conversations we've had about wheat versus tare and sheep versus goats and the illustrations that God's, God's uh, often used uh, that really drive the point home, you know, that he did not sow the tear. He didn't sow that tear. Satan did. God sowed his seed, his, he sowed wheat, okay? Uh, when it comes to his people being lost, lost sheep, you know, when you use that phrase, folks, lost sheep, you're not talking about a non-believer. You're talking about a sheep. First of all, you're not talking about a goat. You're not talking about a goat that was lost, which God went and found and then brings him back and all, all of a sudden he's miraculously transformed into a sheep. He was a goat, but he's now a sheep. God turns a goat into a sheep. That's not the picture. Of course, that's the picture in modern evangelism. But it's not the picture that the Holy Spirit presents. Chosen from the beginning. From the beginning. We know that we, from Ephesians, we were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. Sanctified, set apart by the Spirit of God. We didn't sanctify ourselves through the belief in, in the truth. Verse 14, uh, to this also He called you. Well, how did He call you? On the telephone? Uh, on a two-way radio? Uh, you know, what, uh, through the internet? Uh, uh, I know there are a lot of secondary, what, what I would call secondary means or methods in which you can call someone. But, uh, the crux of the matter is that He calls you through this book. He calls you through the Word. That's how He calls us. To the obtaining of the glory of the Lord of us, Jesus Christ. The glory. That word glory, uh, doxa in the Greek, uh, it's, it's close to the word dakia, righteousness. Uh, it's, but the word literally means to have a proper estimation of the value or the worth of something. Okay? If, uh, I mean, to me, the, if I, I can have a proper estimation of this book, or I cannot have a proper estimation of the value of that book, that's basically what the word glory means. And, and it's the Holy Spirit's absolute desire that we obtain to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. To understand His proper value, His proper worth. What is He worth? Well, I'll tell you, let's see, let's see. what is Christ worth? Well, He, he died on a cross for my sins, but He, he did His part, but he, le he left the rest up to me, so I've got to do my part. If I don't do my part, then uh, I haven't cooperated with God and... and course you know now I mean I go to hell I mean that's if, you, if that's what you believe you don't have a proper estimation of Christ's value not his person not his work not what he did there's no way that you can have but this is what the gospel leads to the proper estimation of his value so then brothers stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught, whether by word or by letter, whether it was spoken, whether it was written from us. Stand fast. Hold fast. Stand firm and hold fast. Two things. Stand firm, hold fast. The traditions that you were taught. I suppose, you know, one could argue, well, you know, or you could look at, at one who, if someone, if you were raised in this system and you came up in this system and, and were educated in this uh, religious uh, system based on human merit, uh, well, and you don't want to be moved away from that, then, well, that's what you're doing. You're holding fast to that tradition. You're holding fast to, to what you were taught. But that is... 
it's not so this takes it completely out of the realm of what man would 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 the, the word tradition here is not the tra traditions of men it is the tradition of scripture of god's word that we're to stand fast stand firm in and hold fast to uh, verse 16 him, him himself now the lord of us jesus christ and god the father of us the one having loved us and having given us comfort eternal comfort eternal consolation and hope good hope by grace you know uh that's a whole sermon the one having loved us well steve i don't i'm not sure he loves me and having given us co eternal comfort well I, steve i don't believe in once saved always saved once saved always saved is 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 that's 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 heresy that's i can't can't believe it i can't believe that well if you can't believe in once saved always saved you can't believe in th that god has given you given us you, us, his people, eternal comfort, eternal consolation, and hope, and good hope by grace, by grace. And I don't, know, I don't know how much I've talked about grace, and 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 I'll probably over eight hundred videos now. Grace, you know, we we sing Amazing Grace, we 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 talk about grace, but folks. The, the the fact of the matter is as we reach the end of this the seventeenth verse here, you know, may he encourage your hearts and may he strengthen them in, in every work and good word. May God encourage your hearts and may he strengthen your hearts in every good word and every good work. This is what the gospel does. In this second chapter of 2 Thessalonians, we see in the context of our Lord's near return for us, we see the, the, the nature or the character of Satan described in such a way which very closely parallels the believer believer's character today uh modus operandi i don't know how you say that uh it, it's it closely parallels the believer's attitude today he exalts self he opposes everything that's good and holy he exalts himself he sits in the temple in the body of christ today i'm talking about the christian who exalts himself and and basically says to God in so many words, you know, I'm in control, not you. I'm God. I determine my destiny. It's it's a lie. It's a, it's a deception of Satan. It's it started in the Garden of Eden. We see it all the way through. We see it now. We they it was certainly alive during the the, the time of the Thessalonian church. In the first century, we see that today. It's 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 in the future. It's it's coming in the future. It will call. It will end. It will culminate in this book destroying Satan's power when say when when Christ returns. Uh, the parallel is there. I guess my, my point here is is that it is probably more of a question than a point, uh, and that is why in the world. Would you, as a Christian, want to live your life in your relationship with God in such a way that it reflects more of the character of Satan than it does one of God's children who's, been, who's received the one and only true gospel which delivers us from the wrath to come? Why would you want that? I'm absolutely convinced that many Christians are stuck in that rut and don't even know it. They don't, they don't realize that they're very, the way that they function as Christians in this world, in this life, 
in their association with that religious system based on human merit, the way that they function is not much different than, well, than what's how Satan functions. Not just now, but how he's going to function during the tribulation period. The very nature and the characteristics of Satan which reflect the very nature and the characteristics of his false apostles who masquerade as angels of light, as messengers of truth, as messengers of the gospel today. Why would you want to take sides with Satan? Why would you want to do that? The only difference between these people in this chapter in 2 Thessalonians here, the only difference between these people who perish, utterly perish, and those of us at the end of the chapter where we've received all of this good news and this encouragement of God's grace and the gospel. The only difference between them and us is that we're His people and they are not. And we didn't become His people by something that we did. I will keep saying this until I'm out of breath until there's no longer any breath left in my body. We did nothing to become God's children. We're God's children because we're God's children. God had has His children. He begat children. You didn't begat yourself. You didn't decide that you were going to become God's children. Oh, Steve, but you know, it says that, that as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the child of God. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what it says. To as many as received him. You could not have received him if you had not been his child. Because before that, you were totally depraved, totally dead, dead in, in, in sin. You had no ability to, to, to hear, to see, to believe, or anything else. We call that total depravity. And so, to, to those who received Him, to them gave He the right to become the children of God. God constructed His Word in such a way as to where that His people, I believe, His people, would hear. And those who are not, will not. doesn't matter how much you want them to. It's, it's heartbreaking. I know it is. Many of, many, you know, we all have family that we'd love to, be, to, to see saved and come to, to know the Lord. We have to trust that God knows what He's doing, that He's alive and well, that Satan is already defeated. We're just in this sort of a holding pattern, but in the time in which we are, we sit, we stand during this present dispensation in, in which we live, uh, this holding pattern, you might say, or this, this, uh, I believe we're the last generation. I, I believe that. You may not believe that. Uh, if you believe that the generations will go on and on and on, that we're not the final generation, that's fine. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, uh, I'm not going to really argue that point uh, against that point too much with you. I think the evidence is is pretty pl is plain as the nose on our face that we are in on the final leg of this journey of ours, and we want to go and meet the Lord with the absolute confidence. At least I do. I would, I would think that you would want to. To see the Lord. To meet the Lord. That, it, that when you do meet the Lord, that you will do so knowing that you lived your life here with an e eternal hope, an everlasting consola consolation, uh, uh, knowing that God loved you. I, I can't even wrap my mind around Christians going to meet the Lord someday who lived their entire lives doubting God, 
doubting God's love for him, uh, that, that God was always looking out for them, planning their life, directing their life, guiding their life, every situation, every circumstance, every event. You know, we, we, we talk about, you know, we, we just love talking about, well, God knows the numbers of hairs on my head. Almost every Christian would, would admit that, that, that God knows the number of hairs on your head. That He's so intimately involved in your life that He's, what, He's just going to, He's going to, He's left you to your own devices. He's left you to uh, His children. Do you, folks, how many of you out there actually believe that God has as His children. I'm talking about God's children here. How many of you actually believe that God has left it, his, it to His children? Left it up to them to, to make it? I, seriously? I mean, here's what we do. We attribute to God... A, a nature or a characteristic that we wouldn't even attribute to ourselves. We would never do that to our own children. We would never leave them, or forsake them, or abandon them outright, just completely just say, I have no feelings for you at all. But we, we believe God would do that to us. Let's have a word of prayer before we close. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for every opportunity that You give us, any time You give it to us to, to come together and just talk about Your Word, to feast on it, to meditate on it. We just ask that You would, you would grant every heart that, that everlasting consolation seal to our hearts the truth of your word that you love us that we're saved by grace through faith that not of ourselves lest any man should boast we give you all the glory all the honor all the praise filter out all that which is foolish seal to our hearts that which is truth for it's in christ's name i pray amen see you next sunday i love you all i truly do thanks for watching